Day five of our trip is a short 160 mile jaunt over Route 160 in Southern Colorado. This is where the spider excels. A few switchbacks, smooth payment, no issues. We check into Durango and say hello to 160 friends, mostly old friends, but a few will become new friends over the next four days. The following morning, I put on my organizer hat for a couple hours. We send 80 plus cars on their way for that day's scavenger hunt. I plan the route each year for Rally North America, and I have been waiting on hitting the million dollar highway in Colorado literally for a few years. Route 550 travels north-south through the Rocky Mountains, and as one would expect, there are plenty of curves between the small past mining towns that dot the mountain landscape along the way. First up, was Silverton, Colorado. Silverton was founded in 1874. The region boomed after the discovery of the Sunnyside Silver Vein. The Sunnyside Mine would become one of Colorado's longest running and most productive mines. In 1992, the mine, the last operating in the region, permanently closed. The closure meant the end of jobs for over one-third of Silverton's workforce. The town's population is now relying on tourism and has since recovered with the addition of multiple ski areas. Silverton now enjoys year-round tourism. North of the Silverton Mine is where the Million Dollar Highway begins. Originally hand-carved by Russian immigrant Otto Mears in the 1880s to transport ore from Silverton to the railroad in Oray, it was widened in 1930, but remains dangerous and narrow in many places. The origin of the name Million Dollar Highway is disputed. There are several legends, including that it cost a million dollars per mile to build it, and that its fill dirt contains a million dollars in gold ore. Coming out of Silverton North, there are several switchbacks, and the 12 miles south of Ure features unprotected cliff sides that are steep, twisting, and completely unforgiving of driver error. It was a dream driving the spider with the top down there. We could take in every inch of the scenery while carving along the twisty road. Our next destination is 15 miles north of Silverton, the ghost town of Ironton. Here we would have to off-road just a bit slowly. We crept towards the former town and parked the spider and decided to walk in. Once called Copper Glen, this ghost town was founded in 1893 as part of the Red Mountain Mining District, the second largest silver district in Colorado. Ironton had a peak population of over 1,000 and had two trains arriving daily from Silverton. The final resident of the town, Milton Larson, appeared as a contestant on the July 1, 1963 episode of I've Got a Secret, with this as a secret. He died a few years later. As twisty as the road was to Ironton, and it was. It gets a bit more interesting after leaving it. The drop-offs are several thousand feet and mostly have no guard railing. Again, twisty, but the beauty of this drive cannot be denied. We stop at Bear Creek Falls and the views there are second to none. It's not a required stop for our rally teams, but many of them stop there anyway to get a look at the valley leading into Oray. We make our way into Oray. It resembles an Old West mining town from the mid-1800s, only with paved streets and modern signage. Rally teams are everywhere in this town. I devised several ways for them to accumulate additional points in the scavenger hunt here. We slowly roll through and fill up with gas at the end of town. We make our way off the million dollar highway and things calm down drastically. We are still at altitude, but the road is relatively flat. We make our way to Ridgeway, Colorado and to the Dennis Weaver Memorial Park. The park is dedicated to the memory and vision of actor and environmentalist Dennis Weaver. I must say it would be difficult to find a nicer setting to be memorialized in than this one. Surrounded by the Rocky Mountains, a bronze cast eagle with a wingspan of 20 feet is the centerpiece of a medicine wheel. From Ridgeway, we head down the mountains, and I'm not joking. At one point, Route 145, which leads to Cortez, Colorado, had a dropping elevation for the better part of 45 minutes. The spider showed 208 miles to empty for the better part of 25 minutes while coasting downhill in six gear. We pass a herd of elk that were just a bit out of range of our cameras, so you're going to have to take my word for it, and we make our way to Mesa Verde National Park. Established by Congress and President Theodore Roosevelt in 1906, the park occupies 52,485 acres of the American Southwest. With more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff dwellings, it is the largest archaeological preserve in the United States. Mesa Verde is best known for structures such as Cliff Palace, thought to be the largest cliff dwelling in North America. On the day we arrived, Cliff Palace Access Road was closed, and as of the making of this video, it still is. That didn't stop us from seeing plenty of structures located in the park. Human life in this area dates back as far as 7500 BC. However, the structures that have been uncovered typically date between 1000 BC and 1300 AD. That is a span of continual habitation of over 2300 years. It is a very impressive place to visit, even if you can't see all of it. What you can see leaves you in awe. We finished the day in Cortez, Colorado. Many of our teams kick back a few cold ones in the hotel parking lot, while us organizers attend a photo verification for the top teams of the day. Yes, I have a couple as well. You know, it's been a long day. 
Day two of our event kicks off pretty much like the first day. Our crack team of volunteers slot our starting grid by amount raised for our charity, Hope for the Warriors. They do great work for veterans and their families. Myself, my partner Scott, send them on their merry way to another day of hunting places and accomplishing tasks for points in our scavenger hunt. I am on my way with the wife to places I wanted to see for quite a few years. What would change today was the landscape. Gone were the Rocky Mountains as we were headed into the desert. Our first destination today, the Four Corners Monument inside the Navajo Reservation. We were asked at the gate to park in Arizona, so we did. I'm pretty sure I used a restroom in New Mexico. It's quite unusual to be in four states simultaneously just by sitting down. My wife spent a few dollars on some of the locals' jewelry, and it's always good to support the local vendors. Plus, due to the size of the car, her shopping was you know, limited. So there's another bonus for the fiat. Next on our agenda was Bluff Fort, the first Anglo community in southeastern Utah. It was settled in April 1880 by Mormon pioneers seeking to establish a mission on the San Juan River. The original Fort Bluff has been rebuilt and restored through the efforts of the Hole in the Rock Foundation. There's plenty there to see. You can learn more about why the pioneers came to Bluff and the journey over the Hole in the Rock Trail. One of the original cabins, the Barton Cabin, may still be seen at Bluff Fort. And that was what our scavenger hunt teams were looking for. They also needed to get two photos of people in period correct costumes this is a great stop with some very friendly people volunteering there we highly recommend stopping here as there's lots to see the drinks and ice cream are awesome and priced inexpensively also the canyon road just north of bluff fort is absolutely astounding it's short but it's sweeping and you're going down through a canyon it's just a fantastic drive i recommend it a few miles west of Fort Bluff, you can find the Sand Island Petroglyph Panel. This roadside panel boasts centuries of rock art spanning from the 19th century to 2,500 plus years ago. Many of the petroglyphs are from the early basket maker through Pueblo eras. More recent Ute and Navajo rock art can be defined by their brighter carvings and locations lower on the wall. Rally teams were tasked with finding the famous Coco Pelli and a bighorn sheep playing a flute. The town named Mexican Hat comes from a curiously sombrero-shaped rock outcropping on the northeast edge of town. The rock measures 60 foot wide by 12 foot high, and that was our next stop. Mexican Hat has frequently been noted on the list of unusual place names. Our next stop is a place that most people have seen a photo of at least once. And if you think you have it and you've seen the movie Forrest Gump, then you've seen this spot. This location is where Forrest decided to stop running, saying, I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home now. It's a pretty bad impression. You must admit the filmmakers picked an awesome backdrop. I can tell you that Monument Valley only becomes more impressive as you approach it. We dropped the top in the spider several times to get a better look, but with temperatures approaching 100 degrees, we, well one of us anyway, was happy that the top on this car goes up and down in mere seconds. We enter Monument Valley Tribal Park. It sits in the Navajo Reservation, is owned and run by the Navajo people. We decide against four-wheeling the spider out into the valley. If you and your vehicle are willing to drive down in, you can. But there are also plenty of tour guides standing by in 4x4s or on horseback, who for a nominal fee will run you down and around. We park by the nearby hotel and decide to hike around and see what we can see from above. And there is plenty that can be taken in from that viewpoint. The valley is filled with impressive monoliths of stone. These invoke what many would consider the Old West of movie fame. John Ford would shoot Stagecoach here in 1939. It starred a former stuntman named John Wayne. It won two Academy Awards and made Wayne a star. It also made the Western a respected film genre. John Ford would go on to shoot six more Westerns in Monument Valley. My Darling Clementine, Ford Apache, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, The Searchers, Sergeant Rutledge, and Cheyenne Autumn. It's said that when John Wayne first saw the site, he declared, so this is where God put the West. And after visiting and taking in the landscape for a couple hours, I'd say we must agree. It's at this point where the entire rally had to be detoured. My original route had us into Flagstaff relatively early. Route 82 would have been 172 miles on a 65 mile an hour road. It was closed due to the pipeline and haywire fires. Our closest detour became 238 miles on a 55 mile an hour road. Now this is the first time that either of us have found ourselves this close to an actual forest fire. We could smell the fire the evening prior in Mesa Verde and Cortez, but today we were driving within miles of it. As we traveled along Route 419, we could see large plumes of smoke billowing from the mountaintops. It was impossible to be upset about a minor detour being added to our day when so many people living north of Flagstaff were being forced to evacuate their homes. It was surreal and concerning driving so close and hoping the fire hadn't crossed the road ahead. Fortunately for us, the road we were on turned south into Flagstaff, and that's where we would spend the next two nights. Hey, if you made it this far, it's sincerely appreciated. If you missed part one, you can check that out over here. 
Also, stay tuned for part three. I have the Grand Canyon, parts of Route 66, a lot of people miss but shouldn't. Also, a trip into Vegas and then a few other things in line for on the way home. Until next time, hey, thanks for watching. We'll see you.